All righty. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Danger Room, the X Men Comics Commentary Podcast. My name's Adam. All our fans are SOBs, Adam. What are you talking about? Yeah, just let me know when we're recording. I wanted to get that out of my system. <laughs> Jeremy, <clears throat> Jer Jeremy we, we started recording already. Oh. My name's Jeremy. <laughs> we are here today to discuss the special double size issue, X Men number 193, the May 1985 issue, on sale February 5th of 1985 with a cover price of $1.25. This one's titled War Hunt 2. Ooh, War Hunt 2. The sequel to War Hunt 1, I guess, right? Yeah, that was X-Men number 95? 94, Giant Size, one of the two. Not Giant Size. I think 94 I was Doomsday <laughs> Impediment. <laughs> yes, that's exactly and, uh, 95 yeah. was War Hunt. So uh, this is, uh, I think, supposed to be like the 100th issue of the Uncanny X-Men, right? So you had Giant Size, then you had 94, and then all the way up through 93. So I guess they're not counting a couple of those annuals, huh? Uh, yeah, well, if you... What was the first one? It was 93? No. Was it, it was 94? Giant Size, and then X-Men 94. So they are counting Giant Size, but they're not counting anything else. I would presume so, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So on the top, on the cover of this guy, you've got special double sized issue. My gosh, you just said it before. It's a dollar twenty five. It's an expensive month for kids back in the eighties. <laughs> yeah, but it was worth it. I mean, look at this cover. There's a lot of. You got a rogue fighting somebody we've never met before. We've got um, who's the guy in the background with a gray metallic suit? uh you mean like those robot guys yeah that's who they are okay uh wolverine <laughs> fighting is that thunderbird it's gotta be i don't know any other characters in the marvel universe that wear that get up oh wait we've already read the new mutants issues we know who that is damn it <laughs> <laughs> all right so it's it's maybe it's not thunderbird but you also have a, a couple of uh i'm gonna guess hellions uh, although you may not know that if you're not reading the pages of the new mutants. I believe you got Empath there stalking in the background. And you've got Shadow Cat in the foreground. And then who's who's the uh, other Hellion girl? Uh, roulette. Roulette, right. She's got the luck power. She's like yeah. long shot, pre long shot. Yeah, she's got a uh, she's got a little roulette chip in her hand to signify her luck based powers. And then uh, you got Nightcrawler bamping around. He's he's really not pr providing much value in this cover. Looks like he's getting shot. It does. Actually, and then you got Colossus there. I, I didn't notice him originally, but he's back there, and he looks uh, he also looks ineffective. <laughs> well, he's about to take on about six different uh, robots. <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, it's action-packed. There's a lot going on here. I will say that it's certainly not my favorite cover. It's I don't think it's really even poster-worthy, um, but, you know, whatever. Okay. Honestly, I feel that way about most of the J.R. Jr. covers. Um, some of them are really good, but I don't know that any of them are T-shirt worthy. Yeah. No. Anyways, he's got some, but this isn't one of them. Uh, so let's open this thing up. This thing is written by Chris Claremont. It's uh, drawn by John Romita Jr. and Dan Green. Tom Orzakowski's lettering. Glynis Oliver is the colorist, and Nocenti's the editor, and Heem... Shooter is the editor in chief. Is this the first appearance of Glynis Oliver? No longer oh. Glynis Bean? Oh, you're right. Wow. Strange. I'm going to guess 100 episodes ago or 100 issues ago, she was Glynis Ween. Lots of things change. Yeah. Divorce. Damn. <laughs> Anyways, uh, talking about other things that change, uh, Banshee is the person that we first see here. He is out on Muir Island and he's doing. Uh, a run he's keeping his body uh in tune even though he's lost his uh, mutant ability you remember that change that he went through when he screamed so loud that he hurt his vocal cords yes indeed he is he's still around after that which is which is nice because like in modern day comics he would probably have his powers back by now yeah yeah so they're really dragging this out or maybe chris claremont's like i don't really like banshee but well, I I think Chris Claremont never intended for Banshee to get his powers back. I think that was part of his long game was, you know, sure. not everybody comes back from their, uh, from their, from their damage. 
which is uh, something I something I, I well I like even though spoilers Banshee will get his powers back but what I'm not entirely sure about is how he ends up getting his powers back maybe his vocal cords just healed and I I'm wondering if it's a different writer altogether you know what uh, well, well we'll see it when we get there but I'm actually thinking it happened during Chris, uh, Chris Claremont's run in the mid 90s yeah well okay everything happened in the 90s that was bad so we get our first hug, ho, hoka, hoka hey. It's not hokeiki, it's hoka hey. Hey. I much, I much prefer it when you say hokeiki, though. Hokeiki. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, and a very large banshee is attacked by a very small thunderbird. Yeah, it's true. Perspective here is really, really weird. But uh, he, he uh, takes down banshee, punches him a whole bunch. And as I said before, Banshee has been doing everything he can do to keep his body in tune. So he's fighting back with all of his might. But this guy that's punching him and stuff, uh, this guy, he's got like the strength of Wolverine. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's what Banshee thinks to himself. Hey, Jeremy, I want to point out we got a little chat going here. Uh, we got some people chatting on the line. Uh, we got, uh, oh, snap, it's going down from Derek Hill. Um Pimpo, how do you pronounce that? It's been forever since I've seen you in the sub box. Hello, guys, says Dead Duck, something, something, something. Uh, where's the X Men themed cocktails? Gotta go hard for the live show. Oh, totally dropped the ball there. Hey, guys, uh, on the ch- special over here, we're, we're gonna pause the podcast while I go make a drink. Uh, Adam, you go riff. No, I'm kidding. So, yeah, uh, if you guys want to participate in the, um, the chat box, it's open, do so, talk. It's going to be very difficult for us to read comic books and uh, respond to your chats. We probably won't do that too much. Uh, and if we do comment on it, it's probably going to be about 10 minutes after you said it because of all the delay in the tubes of the internet that are going to you. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait until we get like, um, I don't know, like 10, and then we'll, we'll, we'll stop every 20 minutes or something. But I got my fastball special right here. This is a this is a hard. I prepared. I have my invisible optic blast right here. Totally, totally. Shame on you! Shame on you! (laughs) Don't talk outside of the podcast, so we don't make plans. (laughs) All right, back to the issue at hand. Oh right, yes, Uh, yeah. So he uh, Banshee gets the wind knocked out of him. He's he's on the ground, and uh, a man who looks like. James Proudstar, the Thunderbird, is standing over him, and Banshee's like, "Ah, oh, laddie, I saw you die." It's true. Then I'm a ghost, says not Thunderbird. <laughs> uh, and unless the X Men do what uh, I say, you'll be one too. And he is punched out. Cut to black. Yeah, man, it's been a long time since we've done a podcast, so. Uh, I had actually kind of forgotten that the professor last issue was mugged. That's right. And here we see him groggily waking up, and the first thing he sees is Callisto. Yeah, and uh, he is dressed up in uh, leather and lace industrial garb. This is weird. <laughs> it's it's goth night in the alley, everybody. The professor's I mean... dancing to some Susie and the Banshees. I, I get it because, you know, this is how the Morlocks dress, but why would they dress him like this? Yeah, I mean, it's not like the muggers actually kind of you know, ripped his clothes. Or maybe, actually, there was a lot of blood. So maybe the professor's suit was so blood-soaked that they're like, we got to change him because it's disgusting. Even we Morlocks have standards. So she changed him into the only thing that they had, which was, uh, you know, studs and leather. <laughs> You know what we have? We have, this guy would look good in a size nine leather strap. We got a few of those in the back. I'm actually surprised Callisto doesn't have like a leash around his neck. That's, she, he's got the little, uh, the leather choker, so he can definitely, there's probably an attachment waiting to happen. <laughs> yeah, and even the professor, he kind of, he's like, what, Callisto, what are, what's going on here? Where are my clothes? What's going on? Good grief, woman, what have you done to me? She saved your life, uh, or she saved his life. Um, the Morlocks found him, and I guess there's a Morlock healer. Uh, I bet you his name is just Healer, but uh, yeah, we, he, we we've seen him a few times before. He's always um, 
he's always comes in in a pinch and I feel like Chris Claremont is realizing that and kind of takes him off the table at this, this moment in time. Right. So Callisto explains that the professor was so far gone that clinically he was probably even dead. It took everything out of their Morlock healer to uh, save him. They didn't even think it was worth it maybe. Uh, and the healer guy, he's going to be out of commission for quite some time because it took a lot out of him to do the healing. I feel like that's a that's a plot device in order to just stop allowing the healer to heal everybody. He's already healed in Rogue, Colossus, and now the Professor. I get probably a couple of people in New Mutants. There's one thing here that I didn't... Yeah, you're right. And we've seen some of those too uh, in earlier episodes. But there's one thing here that, that I don't quite understand right the professor's like uh um let's see he doesn't remember what happened so he says something did happen and it must have been serious and that's when callisto says i've always admired your gift for understatement last night you were beaten nearly to death and then he, she goes on about the healer my question though is how uh, has she always admired the professor for his un, uh, understatement his gift for understatement She's been studying him, you know. She sneaks into the mansion at night and watches him while he sleeps. <laughs> right, because you're, you're following what, you're picking up what I'm laying down here, right? The professor and the and Callisto, to the best of our knowledge, has never met face to face. Yeah, I, I, I feel like they probably have met at least once. But yeah, there's definitely no reason for her to always admire her gift for, his gift for understatement. Unless she watches a lot of TV and she's always tuning into those Professor X debates. Yeah, that guy's uh, really understating. That could be. That's the only other explanation because it makes sense that when Storm defeated Callisto in the alley, she would have filed her report and then all of the X-Men would have read the report, including the professor. So for the professor to say some quip over to Callisto would make sense. But for her to say it back means you're right. She's watching him on TV saying, ah, oh, this guy, he's got a gift for understatement. I'll tell you that. Uh, she is heavily influenced by the newscasters afterwards, who were always talking about, "Oh, that professor! What a, what a, what a, what a, what a gift for understatement he has!" And she thinks to herself, "Yes, yes, he does. He does, doesn't he?" Uh, Callisto gives the professor a broken cup from the 1939 World's Fair. Which, I mean, what are these Morlocks doing? That's an antique. I bet you they could sell that thing for a couple bucks. Yeah, that's a collector's oh. item right there. Uh, Derek Hill on the chat, he says that the Morlocks probably get their uh, wardrobe from Hot Topic, and uh, I agree. <laughs> Good observation. So this is where the uh, Callisto, you know, she goes on with the story about the healer and everything. So they, she takes him down to the alley, um, and the professor says, like, so, oh, so this is the alley. I've only heard about it through the X-Men's description. So, right. So the professor, we've never met. I've never been down here, and I'm going to acknowledge that. So... That okay, happens. so we're definitely going for the TV solution. <laughs> uh, and then Callisto, despite, you know, ordering the healer guy to save the professor's life, is like, uh, any other time, Charlie, and we wouldn't have let you near the place. We may all be mutants, but we ain't friends. Which is totally rude. Like, what's the professor done to Callisto? I, I think she just has a beef against the X-Men, so. And, and, and she goes on to talk about it. She kind of talks about how even though Storm is a human now, she, uh, she's not able to get the leadership back from her until she turns back to a mutant. So there's some sort of uh, uh, law abiding going, like, like the, the, the Morlocks have a, a code of ethics and, and they're going to keep Storm as a leader, even though she's human, because it wouldn't be right for Callisto to take it back now. It's interesting. I, I like that element of this. Yeah, it shows that Callisto's got honor. Uh, which I guess we, we kind of knew before. Um, she, she goes on to say, Callisto talks about the uh, Morlock tunnels and how they go all through Manhattan. Uh, and there's even a point that reaches very close to the mansion. Um, so that's a little plot device that'll come into play down the line. Which supports my theory that she has been watching the professor. Totally. That totally. <laughs> makes sense. So uh, they get to a train and Callisto's like, I can give you a ride home. <laughs> In my train. Mount up, I'll drive you home. Yeah, so they got no resources, but they've got a locomotive engine that they can drive from Manhattan to Westchester. And I don't know geography that well, but I'm pretty sure Westchester is pretty far away from Manhattan. They got a lot of mutants, though, Jeremy. And I'm thinking that they're able to power this train by a mutant, and they're able to 
uh, traject the plane to places where uh, the train to places where it may not necessarily be able to go um, with another mutant. So, <laughs> or, Morlocks, or you can explain everything away with the Morlocks. True enough. Maybe maybe they power the uh, train with the bodies of dead Morlocks. Yes, that's much more morbid, but uh, sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and that's when Sunder runs up and he's like, Callisto, Annalise kids, somebody shot them, murdered them in cold blood. So this emphasizes the point that Callisto has been trying to make to Professor this whole time is that like, we're different, we're persecuted, we're hunted. And look, just while we were having this conversation, Annalise kids were killed. Do you see? There's a war and we're going to fight it. Does, so, does, does this ever get mentioned again? I mean, obviously it, it dovetails into a story, but does Anna Lee and her kids ever have any actual repercussions other than this being the opening of a, of a new thread? I, it's exactly that, Adam. It's an opening of a new thread. Um, they do get mentioned for sure, but just in the sense that Anna Lee no longer has her kids. Do we even know who Anna Lee is at this point? That's what I was wondering. That's why I ask. I don't know who Anna oh. Lee is. I do from future issues, but I don't remember or recall if we've been introduced to her yet. I, I don't believe we have, but I'm very forgetful. Yeah, well, me too. It's a good thing we have this podcast to refer back to. <laughs> good, good thing we have all this, this chat going on. Uh, let's, let's read on down the list and see what we got now. Uh, I think we left off at um, Shout Out Please by Jordan Setzer. Uh, why don't you take the rest of them? <laughs> me, way to put me on the spot. The only one that, that really caught my attention was Landon A saying he got interested in the Commodore 64 and Ghostbusters because of me, uh, and he thanks me, but I thank him for allowing me to show him that to give me the thanks. So you're welcome. And the post is asked, it's a Super Mario Brothers, um, well, you tell them. Uh, it is, it's, it's, it's Super Mario Brothers. It's from the original Super Mario Brothers game. It's not a poster. It's like a bunch of stickers. Each of those are like bricks and, and Koopa Troopas and all that stuff. Yeah, we're old. I thought it was very X-Men related. So I wanted <laughs> to go with something. Uh, no, this is this is my office. This is this is always up. Uh, and just, just for the people that really want an Easter egg, behind me is the Nintendo Entertainment Systems X-Men co- uh, video game. Totally terrible. Is that the NES one? Yeah, it's it's god awful. I'd play it for you, but you guys would probably get sick and turn the podcast off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving right along here in the Rocky Mountains, uh, Thunderbird is uh, well apparently the divot in the mountain from where James Proud stars and Count Nefaria's airplane crashed is still there because he's in it, and. Uh, yeah, he's pulling a piece of metal out from it, and he kind of asks, is this, is this a piece of the plane that exploded that you were on? Which I'm going to assume it is. Yeah, uh, I guess. I mean, how much time has uh, progressed since issue uh, Giant Size number one in this? I mean, Kitty's had at least one birthday, so it's probably been at least a year. Yeah, a year, two years, something like that. Okay. All right, that's fine. Uh, so, so he, he kind of has a flashback, although I guess, I don't know, I guess he's maybe using his imagination to be like, oh, Banshee, is this the place that you came where you didn't save my brother, you dirty murderer? Because he has a flash of Ban- Banshee in the exploding airplane. Yeah, this is, I, this is the power of comics, being able to show and tell at the same time. And, uh, and let an empath show up. Remember them from the cover? I do. But before he shows up, uh, Thunderbird is like, uh, I'm really mad at Banshee, but it's Xavier. He's the guy that started all this, and he fooled my brother with his snake tongue and psi powers, so he's going to pay. Right. Banshee is, uh, he's mad at Banshee because he could have saved his life, uh, Thunderbird's life, and he's mad at Xavier because Xavier got uh, Thunderbird to sign up in the first place. Adam, you've been given a challenge from the chat uh, empath is supposed to have a fan a spanish dialect oh uh wow uh where does he even speak uh let's see uh hola <laughs> uh 
Uh, I don't do a Spanish, but I'm. Oh, whoops, that's my Spanish. bad. I got. It. I can't. Now I'm on the spot. I can't. Uh, Shirley Thunderbird, even you are not stupid enough to believe. No, that's terrible. <laughs> I can't do that. All right, I, can, anyway. I, can, I can do like a Antonio Banderas. Shirley Thunderbird, even you are not stupid enough to believe. But it's 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 turning into some sort of Transylvanian. <laughs> <laughs> eh, six of one, half dozen the other. Yeah. So yeah, empath and roulette show up, uh, and they're like, "Hey, ready to do the thing with the X Men? You can't deal with them on your own. We're a team." Thunder. Uh, what what are we? What is this guy's name? Oh, it is Thunderbird. He's just calling himself Thunderbird. So Thunderbird right. Mark Two is uh, basically saying that he does not approve of the Hellions showing up, but you know he's not going to send them away. Just don't interfere between. Me and Xavier, the final showdown. We are Halians, compadre, and therefore, as our esteemed lady mentor, the White Queen, is so fond of reminding us, supposed to look after our own. I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> no, that was good. That was really good. Uh, no. Uh, so, yeah, it's, the snow is picking up, it looks like. It's getting cold, I suppose. Um, yeah. I don't know, Empath and Roulette, they're, uh, they're, they're um, talking about their plans. Uh, they're basically insulting Thunderbird like he's an oaf. He's too stupid to, for his own good. So he's falling right into our plan. Yeah, Empath is a devious uh, mother. And uh, we see more of his deviousness as Firestar shows up. And she is totally being manipulated by his empathy powers. She has... Yep. Yeah, one thing I want to point out, though, is that uh, Roulette says, um, it, uh, she says, and in the process, some of the X-Men are hurt or worse, so much the better. They are, after all, the Queen's deadly enemies. Um, so Empath and Roulette, are they, are they going rogue or are they operating on the White Queen's word? I think we'll find out more about that in the next issue of New Mutants. Okay. Oh, cliffhangers. I think it's kind of roguish, but uh, I think the White Queen is aware of what's going on. Oh, so she she may just be letting it happen. Maybe she right. didn't directly. Okay. And that's when Firestar shows up. Do you remember Firestar? I do, from the limited series that gets a mention somewhere around here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we read a couple of issues on the X-Men comics commentary Danger Room podcast. That's us. Yeah, so you and I, we we know who Firestar is. So she shows up, and uh, she and Empath are an item, or are they? Nah, she's being heavily manipulated. Yeah, and Roulette's like, ugh. Uh, even she's kind of making fun. I think of Empath like, uh, I, I got to admit, he's slick, but if he ever tries that with me, he's dead. Or and, he'll uh... cut Firestar and Empath kiss because she's under his power and it's creepy and skeezy and Empath is disgusting. Yeah. Meanwhile, back at the mansion, the X-Men or some of the X-Men and just a couple of new mutants are in the danger room and they are getting ready to put Cannonball through his paces. The name of the game is Tag. So what the... Game, uh... Yeah, so, so Cannonball's got to fly towards the X-Men, and all he has to do is tag any one of them, uh, and the X-Men get to use any one of their abilities to dodge, evade, or otherwise um, make him try to use his power so that he can become a little bit more agile. Because the thing with Cannonball is that he's invulnerable when he flies, but he has a very difficult time turning, so not very agile. So they're working on that. The first person to affect uh, Cannonball is Colossus, who punches him, uh, knowing full well that when he is in this state of Cannonball-ism, he is, uh, he's invulnerable. So, so Colossus gives him the full blast of his punch, but as it turns out, that puts Colossus on his team. So Cannonball lands after a big uh, smash with a big smile on his face. And then Kitty comes out and says, Dope! Touching cannonballs is the same as being tagged! Now you're on his side! I am sorry, Kitty. I am not good with tag. <laughs> <laughs> what 
Wolverine, he's like, not good enough, bub. This may be a game, but in battle, that kind of carelessness could cost someone's life. And he swipes his claws at Colossus. Which is kind of, uh, it's a bit much from Wolverine. I mean, that, that's not necessary. Well, the other thing that's weird is that Colossus is like, Wolverine, your claws, be careful. Whoa. And he trips over Kitty, who is behind him doing the whole, you know, schoolyard trick. But Colossus, does he have anything to fear from Wolverine's claws? I yeah, know they the strongest metal on earth and can cut through everything, but can they cut through Colossus? They can. And I don't know if we've learned that yet or if that's coming. But uh, yeah, yeah, we will. We'll, we'll learn about that. Oh, not for a while, though, I guess. Although I guess there was a the fun and games issue where Belasco threw a claw from a dead Wolverine at Colossus. It penetrated his shoulder. So there you go. Yes, it's already been established. Absolutely. Uh, so he, he Colossus he falls down, and then the rest of the X Men are giggling and laughing. And this is Cannonball's moment to strike. So he flies in from behind Nightcrawler, Shadowcat, and Wolverine. But little does Cannonball know that. The X-Men knew that this was going to happen. They're a seasoned team of professionals. So they all phase and teleport and evade. And Knight, or Cannonball just flies right into Colossus's chest. Yes, apparently there was a silent cue from Wolverine. Uh, maybe he, he was smoking a cigarette, so maybe he, he blew some smoke in a particular smoke ring. And that particular smoke ring uh, indicated to everybody that they need to get out of the way, like right about in three, two, one, now. Poof. Dead... Dead Duck 2.0 corrects me. It wasn't Belasco who threw the claw at Colossus. It was Sim. My bad. My bad. Yeah, and actually, he's been, he's been, or he or she has been reaching in and uh, putting in some stuff. He also mentioned that um, there was another one that he mentioned. Oh, well, I lost it. <laughs> the people in the chat window know. <laughs> yes, follow, just... follow, follow uh, Dead Duck 2.0 and uh, Derek Hill has also been filling in the gaps where we have no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. You know what? We should really do these podcasts like this all the time so that we can have a bunch of people just correcting us at all times. I like that idea. <laughs> now we don't have to even read the issues. We just look at the cover and be like, you know, I think Wolverine kills Kitty in this issue. Uh, oh, no. Dead Duck 2.0. Oh, no, that doesn't. No, no, no. That doesn't happen at all. Okay. Well, uh, anyways. Um, the uh, the landscape around them changes to like a space age city. We got Doug Ramsey. He's sitting up in the control uh, t t uh, tower or, or control room with uh, Rachel Summers and uh, Lockheed. So they've turned it into like this whole new exercise. Like an alien shows up, and yeah, this, this is, is the, the, all these characters are from New Mutant Annual One, which we covered. And this is that was the first appearance of Lila Cheney. So oh yes, yeah. this is that world that she was. Uh, she was working with those aliens, and those are the aliens. Right. So, yeah, they continue to do some some exercises here. Uh, Cannonball's outfit turns into the outfit that the professor didn't appreciate in that New Mutants series. Or no, I'm sorry, that's the professor showing up with uh, Callisto. And he's wearing an outfit that Cannonball would have been wearing that the professor didn't appreciate which they actually bring up and cannonball paraphrases what the professor said exactly. And then the X-Men laugh, ha ha giggle, ho ho guffaw, he he. <laughs> Gotta admit though, I blushed. He didn't. <laughs> he wore that man suit proud. <laughs> yeah. So the professor, he's off to, well, get himself taken care of. Meanwhile, in the mid-Atlantic, Aurora is finally on the boat. Remember the last time she tried to leave on the boat? New York was she turned into Kulan Gothland. She mentions that. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and she sees some illusions. She sees uh, a mountain delusion, and she's wondering if it has a deeper meaning. Uh, meaning. And, of course, she's also thinking about her powers and leading the X-Men and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, but from the corner of her eye, a... Uh, illusion or a memory of her mother catches her eye and she runs towards it, hugs it, and it disappears. And now she's like, what is going on? I'm getting the feeling that this issue is very much a setup issue. We're opening a lot of brand new threads here. Yeah, well, it's a double-sized issue, so I'm just wondering if uh, Chris Claremont didn't want to do a you know double-sized issue of an all-out fight with um, Thunderbird Mark II. So he decided to 
pepper the first half of this book with uh, new threads for I guess the next hundred issues. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a it's kind of a little uh, a subtle reboot of getting things started again. Not not really a reboot, but a, a soft reboot, whatever they're calling that. And it's also a throwback, so we get a lot of the the same elements from or in '95. It's a combination. They really thought this out, is what I'm saying. Uh, zombie facehead loves your shirt, Adam. I love it too. It's Wolverine. <laughs> you know what? I I have that shirt, and I almost wore that shirt. Uh, but I I also have that shirt, and I have that same shirt in gray. So that was when I was at the store. I was like, do I really need a gray version of the exact same shirt? And in the end, I was like, yeah, of course I do. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. <laughs> so uh, glad I didn't wear it because that'd have been awkward if we were both wearing the same shirt. Well, we we met up like a half hour beforehand. Sorry, spoiling the illusion. But uh, I would have changed my shirt, or you would have changed your shirt. Someone would have changed your shirt. Actually, maybe that happened. I would have gone shirtless, so it didn't happen. <laughs> Anyways, the professor is soaking in a nice, hot, bubbly bath, and uh, he is now, he's like, oh my gosh, it's, it's hitting me. I don't feel as good as I did when I woke up in the alley. Um, I'm wiped. Yeah, we get a lot of the professor kind of creating this. Uh, he feels like he needs to put on an illusion to the rest of the X-Men. And we'll see this uh, throughout this issue. And actually, I think we see it in the, the New Mutants, the next New Mutants issue as well. He feels obligated to not let the X-Men know uh, what's going on with his, his near-death situation. And he's also thinking that maybe he needs to pull back uh, on some of his field commanding of the X-Men. Right, because everything he does brings him pain uh, to the point the phone rings and he reaches over for the pain and or reaches over for the phone and he's doing it so suddenly that he, he hurts himself. Yeah. Such pain caught me by surprise. Uh, so he answers the phone. It's Nightcrawler. He's like, yes, I'm fine. Trouble? The Situation Room? Summon the X-Men. I'll be there right away. And then he's like, I share a psychic rapport with the X-Men. How did I not hear this before Nightcrawler called me? And this is another instance of, I, I feel like Chris Caramon's kind of uh, wiping the slate clean a little bit in order to, like, this is the perfect jumping on point for the next generation of X-Men fans. Yeah, and I don't know if we've come to it yet. I mean, last issue, it was uh, talked about that Nightcrawler's the new field commander uh, or field leader or what have you, and that's brought up a few times, and it may have already been brought up, brought up as well. But anyways, down at the Situation Room, they bring up on the computer... Uh, an image of James Proudstar, and uh, they instantly recognize him as one of the White Queen's Hellions. And uh, James Proudstar, i.e. Thunderbird Mark II, is like, I've taken Banshee prisoner. In 24 hours, I plan to kill him. I've hidden him somewhere inside Cheyenne Mountain. You want him? Come get him. I'll be waiting. Yes, so we take the story back to where it began. That's true. NORAD. Mm -hmm. So they're like, well, I guess, what are we going to do? The professor's like, looks like he wants to have his revenge. Uh, so it looks like we got to go to NORAD. Problem is, once we go to NORAD, this is what Wolverine works out. Which, like, this issue to me really is kind of like Wolverine coming out as the potential leader of the X-Men. This panel where Wolverine does all this surmising stuff, I kind of hated this panel. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, because it just felt like Chris Claremont shoehorning in elements of the plot that could have just kind of happened naturally. But like, oh, uh, James, James Proudstar has really set us up this time. If we do this, this might happen. If we do this, this might happen. And, and none of it's really concrete. Or there's a third option. None of that could happen. I don't know. I'm not even sure why I'm talking anymore. Investor, it is what I do. Bob Futzer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you got all of those cliches in the one sentence. Uh, but yeah, this is really, this could have been maybe set up as a narration panel. But basically what it's trying to say is like, if we do this caper, we're going to trigger all of the alarms and we're the, the, there's no way we're going to do it uh, uh, discreetly. So we're going to be caught. We may escape, but then we're going to be branded, uh, branded outlaws uh, and that'll suck. But we got to save our own, right? Banshee's one of ours. We've got to go get him. Right, so we're, we're, we're setting up the next phase again, I think. Absolutely. So the professor, he's going to, he's like, yep, uh, we got to do what's necessary to protect the estate and the new mutants while we're away. 
I want us airborne within the minute. So the professor, he's going to come along. Uh, he won't be doing much field commanding, but I think he feels a little bit of responsibility with the whole um, Thunderbird Mark I incident. What well, part of it is that he is not yet willing to let the X-Men know that he is suffering all of this damage. So what would the professor normally do in this situation? He would go along with them. Good, good point. So they're airborne. They fly over to Cheyenne Mountain, codenamed Valhalla, nerve center of the North American Air Defense Command, who is responsible for shielding the United States from any form of air, space, uh, uh, air or spaceborne attack. Um, so really, spaceborne? Yeah, I don't know if like the real NORAD uh, is <laughs> got, has got that in their charter. Uh, if they do, that's pretty sweet. All right. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the they the X Men land they do land discreetly. Uh, Kitty is able to sneak in by phasing into like a storeroom or something like that. And now we've got kind of a psychic link between Kitty, the Professor, and Rachel Summers. They're all yeah. The professor is the Professor is not quite able to uh, maintain that himself, so he asks Rachel to help him out. Yeah. Uh, so using Kitty's eyes psychically, Rachel is able to project an image of where Nightcrawler should teleport uh, through Kitty's eyes to Nightcrawler. So he teleports in safely, Whew, he says in his first line of dialogue, I think. I do like that. I, I kind of like that. I think it gets around the whole Nightcrawler's uh, issues with... The, they, they, set a, they set something that they needed to continue, but this kind of gets around it in a nice way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't mind it at all either. Uh, and, and so, you know, they, Kitty and Nightcrawler meet up and, uh, well, they're, they're about ready to exact the next portion of their plan, which is Nightcrawler teleports in and out of NORAD with the rest of the X-Men uh, almost instantane instantaneously, which is, that's also a kind of a clever trick. He's wiped out after it, though. Kurt, are you okay? Fine, once I catch my breath. I'll be back, Hamar Hadden. As soon as I have a last word with Herr Professor. Oh, you'd think I'd get more practice porting, the easier it would get. I'm really tired. I'm going <laughs> to bed. To coat Kitty Nightcrawler, give me a break. Did Kitty? I guess, yeah, she probably said that. Well, uh, come on, it's the 80s. She's a teenager. All of the teenagers in the 80s said, give me a break. In fact, it was on all the t-shirts right behind Where's the Beef? Don't you remember those shirts? Don't do drugs. <laughs> yes. Uh, mad. Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Uh, what was the This Is Your Brain on Drugs? Was that from the 80s? Oh, yeah, totally with the egg. Man, that might have been late 80s, early 90s. What about, I learned it by watching you, Dad. Oh, yeah, that was that was the yeah Saturday morning cart, cartoons informed me more about drinking and drugs than uh, anything else. And I was like, Dad, how come you're not teaching me to smoke weed? That guy's dad is. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the, the Nightcrawler and the Professor have a little conversation as uh, Lockheed sleeps nearby. Um, Nightcrawler still feels kind of uncomfortable with the idea of leaving the Professor alone. Uh, the Professor says, "No, no, it's 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 cool," and um, you know, just just hurry back. And uh, Nightcrawler disappears, and that's when the Professor reveals to us, the audience, that he is extremely exhausted. And he did not want to reveal that to Nightcrawler. And then he connects up with uh, Cerebro in order, I guess they have a portable Cerebro. And they he's going to figure out where Banshee is using this portable Cerebro. Yep. But that's when Roulette uh, was, uh, she and, uh, um, what's this guy? This guy's, uh, Empath. Empath, thank you. Oh, uh, I should be drinking my, Optic blast. <laughs> anyway, you should be anyway, drinking something. You should be drinking something. Um, she, she, they were expecting the X Men. So even though the Blackbird is cloaked and it looks like it's covered in some netting with like some snow on it, she finds it. Of course, she's roulette. She's lucky, uh, and so she throws a disc or something at the airplane. It's one of her black chips from the cover. Oh, okay. So she throws that at the plane, and apparently her luck uh, powered puts it right where it needs to be, and then like all of the electronics in Blackbird go haywire, which basically knocks the professor out of commission. The professor says, Yarg! 
<laughs> Thank God we got one of those. Uh, Empath walks onto the airplane, sees Lockheed, who is about to launch into action, but Empath is able to make Lockheed so scared that he flies through the window uh, and he's miles away before anybody knows the difference. And then there is a psychic battle between the professor and Empath. Um, and because the professor is so weak, he is uh, struggling to uh, actually challenge Empath. Under normal circumstances, he would uh, cremate Empath, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, at this point, he is a roulette person, and she's able to get the draw on the professor, and she uh, sprays him with some sort of gas that knocks him unconscious. Yeah, yep. And so he goes down for the count, and uh, so it was a team effort. Both uh, both Empath and Roulette took out the professor, and they're like, well, he's not going to be out for long, but uh, uh, his psi powers are going to be done for a full day. So even if he does wake up, he's going to be totally ineffective. Rachel, at this point, she's like, Professor, uh, he's under attack. I can't sense his thoughts. Something's happened. Rachel, I... Well, and then we cut right to, I guess... Kitty, Kitty jumps basically from panel to panel. So I wonder if the X-Men are like twiddling their thumbs while this is happening. But she, bur she bursts into the uh, Blackbird and she says, Rachel, I'm in the Blackbird. Can you hear me? Relay this to the Nightcrawler. It's bad. The professor's alive but unconscious. There's no sight of Lockheed or whoever ambushed them. And all the sensors, especially Cerebro, have been trashed beyond repair. Uh, now Nightcrawler starts doubting himself. Ugh, I should have known. I should have anticipated. I'm a terrible leader. All right, so Cyclops has his horrible eyes. What was Storm's thing? Storm didn't really have... Oh, uh, she was claustrophobic, but that wasn't really much of a hindrance to her. But Nightcrawler's uh, insecurity over his leadership is annoying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like the Cyclops' fear of his eyes level annoying. Because <laughs> this will not be the first time that Nightcrawler self-doubts. It will be the worst. It's like his default position. <laughs> I, I don't know why I'm the leader. I'm so terrible at it. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I wonder, you know, not to totally nitpick, but like what throughout the pages of the X-Men made Nightcrawler the obvious choice to replace Storm? Was it just the fact that uh, it couldn't be Colossus, it couldn't be Kitty, and Wolverine didn't want the job? Yes. <laughs> I was going to say that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you know, Wolverine's like, get over it. What do we do next? I don't know. I'm not a good leader. All right, let's try this. Uh, Rachel, you're our backup telepath, so you scan for Banshee and we'll find him. And she freaks out and she's like, no. And he's like, what? I'm the leader. I'm giving you an all. Uh, okay. I guess she's not going to do it. This is where Rachel... You're really re making my, uh, my leadership skills in doubt. They're already in doubt. Now they're even more in doubt. I, I don't know what to do. Rachel now thinks to herself, that like, I was a hound in my era, and I used to hunt down mutants so that they'd be killed. I can't do this. They can't make me do this. And then she doubles over, and she is not going to help. She is incapacitated for most of the rest of the issue, uh, Kitty and Wolverine take off, and they decide to kind of take over. Oh, Adam, uh, Colossus says after Rachel doubles over, by the White Wolf, which I believe is the first time Colossus has ever said by the White Wolf in this issue. You're right. You're right. <laughs> okay. C certainly the first time he said it on a live podcast. Definitely. Definitely first time in video. Well, well maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways. So uh, Kitty and Wolverine, so they take... We, we... Wolverine surmises that Ray's got secrets and memories uh, and, and probably guilt about things that happened. It's like somebody who survived the Holocaust. Maybe she feels ashamed for having lived and for the price she paid to do it. So she knows that he's got... or He knows that she's got ghosts. Yeah, I guess Wolverine would be the person to be able to identify with that. Because he is the, uh, I don't know, he, he should have been the leader. They should have just suck it, sucked it up and made him the leader. Professor should have been like, you want to stay in X-Men? You're a leader. and you, you don't get the option to say no. Sorry. Right. He's, he's more of the parent. 
we get kind of a cool uh, side panel of Cheyenne Mountain here, which is very G.I. Joe Pit-esque, where you've got all the various rooms. I was thinking the same thing. It, it's it's They're basically phasing down from floor to floor, and we don't get too much detail of each of the floors. But yeah, it's definitely like one of those uh, pit blueprints. Off to the left, you've got a giant like nuclear missile, which is kind of scary. Is that a missile or like a rocket? Well... I guess I mean, it's no rad, so you're right. It's probably a missile. Yeah. Uh, so there they go. Uh, Nightcrawler's really upset. He so wants to do well, but I keep wishing Storm were here is what Kitty says. Uh, but uh, Wolverine's like, look, we make do with what we got. And right now what we got's bad, but we're going to make do with it. So let's go. Quit worrying. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't say all of those words, but. So Nightcrawler and Rogue, they teleport back to the airplane and uh, they drop uh, Rachel off. Colossus, I guess, is there now. No, actually, yeah, Nightcrawler Rogue, is Rogue teleport- is outside in order to uh, protect the professor. She's she's defense now. And uh, Colossus, I don't know why they don't bring Rachel back. Yeah, well, she's incapacitated. She's all like, oh, I used to be a hound. So she's like passed out with grief and fear, I guess. Hmm. Uh, see for yourself, Tavorish. What happened to her, Kurt? What did she see? What did she experience in her world of the future to leave such awful scars? You're the leader. Tell me. <laughs> at, the young, at the moment, I'm more concerned with my own future, or our own future. I'm a bad leader. <laughs> All right. So, uh, and then Nightcrawler keeps going and it's like, this is terrible. Would this have happened if Storm or Cyclops were in charge? To be fair, the mission is falling apart. However, that is hardly Nightcrawler's fault. And it, this like next panel of him talking about it really doesn't help at all. He's yes. Not a good leader. Exactly. A, a good leader would realize like, okay, everything's falling apart, but for the good of the mission, for the good of the team, I need to keep things together. I need to come up with another plan, even if it's a bad plan, but pretend it's the best plan so I can keep these people's spirits high and with any luck, we'll make it through this mission. But instead, he's just moping for his poor leadership abilities. Which just makes him a worse leader, to be honest. <sighs> I feel like we're doing a lot of ripping on Nightcrawler here. You know, he's a fan favorite. <laughs> I like Nightcrawler. He's great. Yep, me too. Anyway, he's, he's probably the most fun voice to do. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so back at NORAD, uh, there's another tour coming by, and one of the NORAD control panels is just like, oh, for God's sake, this is what we need. All right, as you can see, this is the Cheyenne Mountain Complex. But the visitors here are Empath, Roulette, and Firestar in their plain clothes. And so they're about to start some mischief. And they do. Um, they, they start to create some hot-headedness in the uh well first first roulette uh causes some of her luck powers which uh allows the no rad employees to spot the x-men and then empath heightens the uh general general morrison's uh response to that and they send out uh these the robots from the cover secbots uh with an order to shoot to kill so Empath is basically controlling everything here. There's a full-on panic. People are running to and fro. And in all the confusion, Firestar slips away so that she can uh, enact her portion of the plan. Um, and I think maybe Roulette's helping. Maybe her luck power is just emphasizing Empath's empathy ability. So that... No, I think I she know. was just there to uh, help them spot the X-Men. Okay. The so, X-Men, uh, Wolverine and Kitty, meanwhile, have discovered Banshee. Uh, we forgot to mention that Wolverine smelled uh, Banshee, and that's how they were able to figure out where he was. Um, Banshee's alive, but unconscious. He's been beaten pretty badly. I'll lay odds, darling. This is the creep that did it. Step out of the shadows, punk. Fight like a man for once. Uh, Thunderbird knocks Wolverine down and Wolverine says, Oh, ho, nice move, bub. <laughs> <laughs> You're good boy. Maybe even better than your brother, but I'm the best. Uh, Kitty phases Banshee free of his chains and uh, she starts uh, rescuing him. Uh, neurotoxin starts coming into the room 
and uh, Thunder. I think that's part of Thunderbird's plan. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's a NORAD thing or if that's part of Thunderbird's plan. Um, no, no clue. It seems possible that it. I don't know. It's probably a NORAD thing. But anyways, uh, uh, Wolverine and uh, Thunderbird here are fighting. Uh, Wolverine's pretty much got the upper hand. Uh, Kitty phases back into the room, and as we learn, as she goes from one room to the next room, uh, she is actually breathing, so once she catches a whiff of the neurotoxin, she solidifies and falls to the ground. She's out for the count. Wolverine's like, ah, oh, you dumb girl. <laughs> Why didn't you that, trust me? I do like these uh, two panels of Wolverine and Thunderbird fighting. It's This, this, is, uh, this is where John Romita Jr. does really well, in my opinion. These are, these are the, some cool fight scenes. The action-packed fight scenes, definitely. Uh, you got you got Wolverine and uh, Thunderbird going arm to arm, holding each other back. But then Wolverine is able to use Thunderbird's arm as leverage to knee uh, Thunderbird in the face. That's cool so, stuff. Yeah, it's really good stuff. And uh, but as as uh, Wolverine is distracted by Kitty, who is affected by the neurotoxins. Uh, Thunderbird's like, this is my chance, and he does it. He punches Wolverine across the face. Any other man probably would have taken his head clean off, but since Wolverine's got adamantium-laced bones, uh, it hurts Wolverine, but it really hurts Thunderbird. I think this is the first time we've seen somebody react to the adamantium uh, in this fashion, which is nice. I mean, this will become a mainstay, but we haven't seen it before, I think. So with the, I think you're right. So with the neurotoxins... Uh, Going into the room, Thunderbird heads for the exit. Wolverine is trying to save Kitty, but even the neurotoxin is overcoming his healing ability. So he's like, oh my God, if I stop, if I even think about this for a minute, I'm going to die. Thunderbird turns around and he's like, oh man, look at them. They should die, but I don't want them to die. What's going on? Yeah, this is kind of, uh, this is what makes me think that the neurotoxin is not from NORAD. Um, Thunderbird basically goes back in and saves them, and he saves them partially because they had nothing to do with his brother's death, especially Kitty, who he points out wasn't even a member of the team, um, and he's just not cut out to be a, a killer. But he thinks of himself as a coward because of this, which uh, we'll play later into the issue. Yeah, yeah, he's self-doubting. What's become of me? I've trained for this. Uh, I got to do this, but I'm a coward. I don't understand what's going on. Uh, I have to slay Johnny's murderer, Charles Xavier. So now he's kind of refocused. He's not going to kill these innocents, but he's definitely going to kill the professor. But meanwhile, across the Nor NORAD uh, floors, you've got Colossus and Nightcrawler who are in sort of like a stock room, uh, which giant robots burst into. We get, uh, we get our first rogue throwing Colossus fastball special, and I'm, I'm going to drink to that. Oh, cheers. I wish I had a, had a drink. Oh, it's delicious. <laughs> ah, that was tasty. Surprise, suckers. Ain't nothing can hide or escape from the sec bots. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> are there people in the sec bots or are the sec bots autonomous robots? I think there are people in the sec bots. Weird. I could be wrong. Um, we'll have to watch out for like sec bots getting their arms ripped off or their heads ripped off. <laughs> Good point. Good point. So they're like, all right, well, let's, let's do this thing. Uh, Nightcrawler teleports out, grabs rogue. And then yes, rogue does the first Colossus fastball special, which you already drank towards or two. And uh, Colossus takes out, I don't know, two or three of the sec bots. And fight scene. <laughs> yes. There's a lot of robot fight scenes here. One of the robots is able to bind up Nightcrawler in some robot rope. Uh, Colossus grabs one of the sec bots and in this sec bot that we get a close up, it does look like there are some human eyes inside and he's twirling it around, knocking all over, uh, over the other sec bots. Those eyes are really far apart from each other. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a special person. <laughs> <laughs> and so rogue, I guess they brought Rachel from the airplane to the storeroom, I guess. I thought Rogue was protecting the ship. I don't know. They keep bringing these people back and forth in and out of NORAD and the uh, the Blackbird. Oh, okay. Uh, Nightcrawler went back for reinforcements when the SecBots came in. 
So she grabbed, uh, there's a Banff and she grabs Rogue. So Rogue is back in the battle. Uh, Firestar comes in and she is there uh, basically to take out the X-Men. Not much of a plan Empath has there. But uh, she immediately takes out Colossus with a Lennon's ghost. Oh, for the first time in this issue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Rogue comments on the heat flash from the girl. She got a sh- shield Ray uh, Rachel's body with her own. So I guess maybe they brought Rogue and Rachel so that Rogue could still maintain protection over Rachel, even though they're basically putting Rachel in harm's way because Rachel's well, totally effective right I think, now. I think Rachel was um, never brought back. Uh, I don't know why, because I would think that they would want to get her out of harm's way. But I don't, I don't think Nightcrawler ever got a chance to bring her back to the ship. Hmm. Well, anyways, uh, Rachel, I'm sorry, Firestar breaches the side of the NORAD mountain with Colossus. Um, Rogue has been protecting Rachel's body, but then the Sekbots come and they're like, oh, those x broads those x broads look pretty much finished. Let's make sure. We cut back to the NORAD General Morrison, who uh, who is now in front of Nightcrawler, who has been captured by, uh, what did they call it? Catchweb. Ooh, the Catchweb. And um, Empath now makes Nightcrawler go a little crazy. Um, not before Nightcrawler spots Empath, but uh, now Nightcrawler is able to bamp out of the Catchweb, which makes sense. And then he is very aggressively angry and smashing lots of humans around. Now you'll learn what it's truly like to have a mutant as a most deadly foe. No bonds can hold a teleporter, and none of you have the power to stop me. No, because I am Nightcrawler, the good leader, when Empath controls me. Right. So Empath is definitely stirring the pot of frenzy and panic within the confines of NORAD. You know what? This is a good story that is waiting to be happened. Nightcrawler has this uh, side of him inside him to be a good leader. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if this ever gets touched upon. Probably not because I'm making it up. I think that, that would have been uh, an interesting, like, residue or result of this comic is that through Empath's actions, he inadvertently gives Nightcrawler the confidence to be a very good leader. Yeah, that would have been cool. Spoilers, that doesn't happen. <laughs> So Firestar is still flying uh, Colossus up into the air. Colossus is like, I could kill this girl with a single blow, but she is so young, so much like my baby sister Ileana. How can I harm her? I am not good at hurting people. (laughs) But if I do nothing, she will destroy me. What am I going to do? I will converse with her. Who are you? Why are you attacking us? Please let (laughs) me know. I, I wish to discuss. As she says that she's Firestar, she's like, you X-Men started this. Empath told me so, and he don't lie. So there, I'm going to hurt you. But wait a minute. I guess now that she's kind of out of the range of Empath, uh, she's starting to get back her own mind and realize that what she's doing is a little little whack job. I'm not evil. I don't even want to harm anyone. But if I don't do as Empath says, he won't care for me anymore. Which I ask, like, would Empath really make you think you're evil, or would he make you think like you're doing the right thing? You're you're exacting revenge for something that uh, happened to James Proudstar's brother, and and because you're our friend, you're going to help us uh, get this revenge. And it's not evil; it's a good thing to do. I'm thinking that you don't really think about what it is that Empath wants you to do. You just kind of think that it's the right thing because Empath wants you to do it. But now I feel like she's sort of getting out of that range, and she's able to think more cohesive thoughts around the whole thing, but not, not a hundred percent. So you think that she uh, derived the whole, this is kind of evil what I'm doing. I probably shouldn't be doing this. Maybe. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Okay. Anyways, uh, rogue flies in and she knocks both of them out and grabs both of them. And she's like, ugh, I could absorb her powers. Uh, and no, she, then... does, she does absorb her uh, fire stars powers. Yeah. And she says, um, oh, so that's what she does is she runs up there. She flies up there. She grabs onto Firestar, taking her abilities. And that's when she's like, oh, Firestar's a nice kid. She's a little lonely, but uh, Empath's messing around with her. Huh. 
Okay. I see what's happening here a little bit. I was a nice kid once. Then I went and kissed that. Cut to you. And then I. <laughs> oh, we don't know that yet. Oh, sorry. Spoilers. <laughs> so back. Uh, we cut back to NORAD where we have a lot of fighting and um, Thunderbird has made his appearance in uh, uh where empath is and he's he's kind of yelling at empath it's like why why'd you why'd you have to do this man this is like my business get out of my business i don't know why he's from the bronx but he is <laughs> so while thunderbird is roughing up empath kitty phases up from the floor grabs empath's legs and pulls him uh, into the well into a sub basement and that's when wolverine comes out and says we're gonna have a little talk you can try your power on me, and it might work. But if it doesn't, snick it. <laughs> he fainted. Like I figured, no guts. So Empath is out of the picture, so nobody is under his control anymore. Uh, that immediately affects Nightcrawler, who uh, starts bamfing roulette around the room in order to take her out of the picture. Um, the humans are still a little riled up and they're shooting at Nightcrawler. They don't realize that Roulette is actually a bad person. So they think that uh, Nightcrawler is just being a jerk about it. Um, Thunderbird kind of feels like this whole thing is a disaster. Um, he almost gets pulled through the floor by Kitty Pride, but his, uh, his skills are too good for her and he's, he manages to dodge out of the way. Damn Wolvie, sorry, he was too darn fast. No sign of Nightcrawler or Roulette either. So, uh, he hopes that means that Kirk got away. Wolverine's like, we gotta, he lights up a cigarette, which seems like an odd time, like, okay, battle time, trying not to get noticed by the NORAD folks. This is what we're gonna do, Kitty. <laughs> it's like the rock token. We don't know this about Wolverine, but he's all nerves, and you know, the cigarettes really calm him down. Oh, that, that makes a lot of sense. That explains the drinking too. <laughs> he's a stressed out little guy. So, Kitty's wondering, like, why didn't Proud Star kill us? He totally could have. Uh, why did he save our lives? And Wolverine's like, who can say, darling? The only thing for us to do is slog and scrap our way to the finish and make sure we're among the survivors. Isn't that what the X-Men do best? I read in the files that John Proudstar was pretty decent because I read the files. Like everybody reads files. Everybody's read supposed files? to read the files. It's like a thing. It's like a it's it's one of the classes. There's like uh you know world civilization with Professor X and then the files. That's that's a class. The files 101. <laughs> Johnny was a lot like me, Wolverine says. Uh, and then he says, shoot, because some light uh, uh, hits them, and it's the sec bots. Oh, man. You got move it back. Please. And Rachel awakens. Rogue's like, at last, Sleeping Beauty awakes. Don't make fun, Rogue. This isn't fair. I failed you. Yeah, Rachel feels like she kind of uh, panicked because of the whole uh, well, to to follow orders because of her sort of thing. Um, she is now able to sense Logan and Kitty's thoughts, though. Um, uh, they're they're fighting hard, but they're outnumbered. They had they have a prayer, and Rogue asks her to telepathically. Uh, lead them to her but she still can't do it she's still unable to push forward past this this old memories that she has and um rogue says well then give me the power yeah and, and that's when she doesn't she, she doesn't want to do that rogue will know what's going on right and she's like what am i going to do if i if i do that uh, rogue will know what i'm uh what's going on in my past and i'm already not ready to tell them and that's when nightcrawler teleports in uh, and he's got a different plan. Uh, he wants Rachel to psychically use her power to find him a place to teleport. Uh, you know, it's a plan. He's a leader. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess he's he's actually pulling a little bit of the leadership card out here. And, uh, but Rachel's like, but it's too risky. Uh, I can give you a mental image, but it'll be blurry. It won't be accurate. It'll be vague. 
and Nightcrawler's like, um, uh, you don't need to accompany me. Just feed the image into my mind. And she says, well, if you're willing to take the risk, I guess I can too. That's my brave girl. Yeah. I wish. So uh, he's, he's, he's becoming a little bit more of a leader. Uh, so Rogue flies off with Firestar's unconscious body. And, uh, you know, Night or Colossus is like, I will stay here and return as soon as Nightcrawler uh, it comes back. I wish they had made more of a big deal out of uh, Nightcrawler actually taking a leadership role in this. Cause like it, it, they don't even really talk about it. Like nobody says, Hey, like Wolverine could pat him on the back later. You really pulled your, uh, you really pulled your weight in the end there. Good job, buddy. Uh, yeah. The, one, the other thing I don't quite care for about this issue is there's like two set pieces, which is basically uh, stock rooms inside of NORAD. And then like the outside of the, like blanket covered um, blackbird. Just, it's not very dynamic. Is the blanket supposed to prevent you from seeing the night, the night, the, the whatever, blackbird. blackbird? I think they threw the blanket over it and then they put snow on top of the blanket to, uh, yeah, to, to hide, to camouflage the blackbird, which seems silly, but whatever. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, so back on the airplane, uh, a man says, open your eyes, old man. The end of our life, the end of your life is at hand, and it is Thunderbird Mark II. Yes, he has finally come uh, tete-a-tete with the professor. This is, this is what the whole issue is coming down to, is this face-off. Uh, the professor is unable to side-scan him because he's too weak. Uh, instead, he's going to rely on talking to him. Um, he's nothing to lose by fighting James since whatever I do, uh, what, uh, since whatever I do, you plan to take my life. Isn't that so smart man, go to the head of the class, but gutsy too. I'll give you that. I'm kind of doing a Wolverine for that. I haven't really <laughs> figured out Thunderbird yet. Well, you don't want to do like the traditional native American voice because that would be racist. Yeah. That's where I started and I felt bad about it. <laughs> that's why I had to stop doing the uh, Hispanic voice for uh, empath because it's just, it's too racist. Well, it's, that's it's, not what we're here about on the Andrew podcast. No it's, racism. It's, it's not. We. It's not racism because we do everybody equally bad. So, <laughs> but you know, we're not racist. Therefore, our our stereotypical impressions are not racist. I hope. Maybe we are racist. I don't know. <laughs> I, ho I hope not. I hope not too. You heard so, it here first. We may or may not be racist. <laughs> We're pretty sure we're not, but there's a possibility that we are. We're, we're leaning towards the first, but you be the final to judge. Uh, the professor's thinking here, he's like, oh, man, I got gassed, and now my psi powers are all dead. I can't project thoughts. I mean, I could mind strike this boy if I wanted to, but I can't. Uh, so I got to rely on my intellect and my intelligence. But, uh, yeah, so I'm going to use my mind. And say, all right. We can fight, but, you know, this isn't you. I knew your brother. He's a pretty good dude. And I think if you learned anything from him, you would also be a pretty good dude. So are you good dude? The, the professor makes a point that uh, do you really think that your brother, who you respect and uh, admire, was coerced by me to join the X-Men? Uh, you, you know him better than anybody, and you know that he wanted to do this. And that kind of turns the tide for Thunderbird. Thunderbird's like, stop playing with my mind, old man. Shut your mouth. You killed John, and I'm going to kill you. I got this knife. Johnny taught me how to use it. I'm going to use it on you. And we get four panels of the knife. We get, a, where we get closer and closer. And as we get closer, the knife is shaking and shaking. And it, he drops the knife. He doesn't want to do it. That's when mm -hmm. Roke shows up and says, Professor, I got Firestar's powers. You want me to incinerate the little creep? Uh, the professor's like, leave him be, rogue. James, listen to me. A coward? You're not a coward because you couldn't kill me. You're brave. Uh, you honored your, your whatever to your brother. You wouldn't want to desecrate the memory. So you are a warrior. Or, you know, something like that. And scene. Pretty much. 
<laughs> Weapon X on the chat, Adam, he, he's never seen you before. I want to remind people out there on the live podcast and the video that there are there's a series of uh, X-Men reviews that we did in which you do get to see our faces. Uh, Adam, you recently posted, uh, what, issue 94, 95 or something yeah, like that? Yeah, it was 94, so it's a couple of years old. Um, but we look kind of the same. It was, what, three years ago? Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, uh, and, and there's another video that I think we did for one of the early X-Men uh, during the Sterenko run, which was uh, with with uh, Magneto and uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Lorna Dame. Yes. So we've been in front of the cameras before, but but he says uh, he says that he did not think that you would look like what you look like. He thought you would be plumper and nerdier. So I think well, that's, that's I think that's a compliment. That's the plague of the radio voice, right? I always like whenever I actually see the radio announcer, um, they never look like what I expect them to look like. So maybe um, maybe what he's saying is that you don't sound handsome. <laughs> Oh, do you know what sure. I mean? Because you hear a lot of these radio people and you're like, oh, he's got such a smooth, silky voice. And then you see him, he's like a big fat guy who's super ugly. And like, oh, he's got a face fit for radio. So maybe you should be on TV. I, wow. Uh, I, I'm not going to take any of that into account because uh, it is very unlikely that there are any uh, executives with any power watching this whatsoever. Yes. <laughs> also want to point out Weapon X says that the image is split pretty blurry. Uh, that is totally our fault. We're broadcasting with all the bandwidth we can possibly pump through these pipes. But Adam and I are using probably very old, very poor quality webcams. <laughs> yes, I am using an eyesight. Dead Duck 2.0 says that he doesn't think that we're racist. Yay! Just mm -hmm. underappreciated amateur voice actors. I like that. I'm going to put that on my resume. Adam, underappreciated amateur voice actor. Yes, one day you're going to hear our voices doing commercials for soap. <laughs> or maybe uh, soap. <laughs> maybe we could get uh, some sort of like cameos in a in a future X-Men cartoon. Holy crap, that'll never happen. <laughs> All right, back at the mansion, uh, we got to wrap things up here. This issue's got to be wrapped up. This live podcast has got to be wrapped up. So let's do that. We we kind of debrief. Uh, we got uh, everybody's back here. Empath and Roulette, they're passed out upstairs, so they can't cause any trouble. Uh, Rachel, she's back up to snuff. Firestar, she's kind of she's kind of in the fetal position because she's kind of like really the gravity of what she's done is kind of sinking in. Um, but uh, Rogue, she bursts in. She she found she found Lockheed. God knows where he's been this whole time. And Kitty is very happy to see like Lockheed. Uh, I was. I was never so scared. I thought I'd never see you again. Thanks a lot, Rogue. I really owe you. And uh, uh, Thunderbird, he's in his plain clothes, and he's like, well, what's going to happen to us? You know, we caused a lot of trouble. And uh, You like, stay or go as you wish. I don't care. I'm the leader. Kind of, even though the professor's here, and he's going to do a lot of talking in a minute. Uh, and uh, they're like, well, I guess if you're not going to punish us, I guess we're going to, uh, uh, Thunderbird's going to take Empath and Roulette back to Massachusetts, back to the uh, Miss Frost's uh, Institute. And Rogue's like, what? Nah, who's been brainwashed? You can't go back to them. And Firestar wants to go back too, and they are a bit surprised, but it, it turns out that like that's that's their family. Um, that's like the X-Men. They want to go back to their friends and the, the folks that are their family. And so it makes sense. But hopefully going forward, they will be uh, better buds. I don't know. I guess uh, it just the way that the comics portray uh, Emma Frost, the Hellfire Club, and the Hellions, you almost think that or they're, they're portrayed with like a very two-dimensional cartoonish evilness. So now to see kind of this humanization of like, well, they did some bad things, but they're still my buds. On the one hand is kind of refreshing, but on the other hand, it's basically a 180 from everything we've seen from them up to this point. I'm okay with the 180, as long as it's like you said, refreshing. Yeah. And the other thing I didn't realize that uh, Firestar became a Helligan. Yeah. We never saw that. 
No, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, but, uh, you know, the professor is like, well, I understand. I pray the White Queen proves deserving of such trust should circumstances change. However, Angelica, you will always have a place here. Uh, technically, I think as chronologically goes, uh, as far as the issues were released, this is the first ever appearance of Firestar. Uh, I don't think issues one or two, which we covered of the Firestar miniseries, have been released yet. Um, they they are mentioned somewhere in a footnote in this issue. So nope. they're, they're, no. No? No, I mean, you are correct. Uh, you are correct. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, this is, this is the first appearance of Firestar chronologically the issues that we already covered on the podcast were written after this issue but take place before this issue what i don't know and you might know is did she first appear in the amazing spider friends or spider-man and his amazing friends was she created I, for that i don't know the answer to that question i mean she definitely did with spider-man and iceman but i don't know which came first I think that that show might have come first. I could be totally wrong on that, but I feel like I scanned a Wikipedia at some point and maybe I'm just thinking of Harley Quinn. I don't know. <laughs> Chat window, as we finish up this issue, you let us know, because um, I don't know. Uh, Dead Duck 2.0 thinks the cartoon was the first, so I, eh, it sounds about right to me. So we'll go with that. He's been right so far about everything else. We rely on him. <laughs> New fact checker for the Danger Room podcast. Uh, all right. So Thunderbird here, he's going to go collect his people. And he's like, well, you know, the TV has been saying some pretty bad things about the X-Men. Maybe I could turn myself in and, and that would take the heat off of you. And uh, the professor's like, don't worry about it. Nothing was ruined. Nothing was hurt. We were, it was all repaired. Uh, we've, uh, we've survived worse. Don't worry about it. You don't need to spend the rest of your life behind bars. You're a good man. Yes. Yeah, so as Wolverine suggested earlier in the issue, this is a turning point for the X-Men. They are now wanted outlaws. And that's, that's, that's the new order. That's how it's going from here on out. Epilogue. So finally, uh, not finally, <laughs> finally, this issue is almost over. No, the epilogue. Uh, across town, we got uh, it's Jamie Rodriguez. You remember him, right, Adam? Yes, uh, he was the guy that uh, momentarily was dead. Yes, uh, through Kulan Goth's little amulet thing, but uh, I don't know, things were reversed and Nimrod saved his life. And so he's at the dinner table with, I think, his kids and his wife and his father, and they're talking about, oh, these, well, the father's talking about, like, oh, these dirty mutants, and we got to round them all up and... Jamie Rodriguez is like, oh, that's a stupido, Luis. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Some muties are good, some muties are bad. It's just the way things are. What if they said that about an Hispanic or a black person? And Luis is like, it's not the same thing. I know you. He's like, whoa, what if I was a mutant or your grandson? And Luis is just not bending. And Luis is like, I thought I knew you, but I do not know you. And that's when Luis is like, oh, wow. What about that Nimrod guy you got in your room? He kind of gives me the willies. Yeah, so uh, the last time we saw uh, the uh, Jamie Rodriguez, he was uh, Nimrod stopped Kulan Goth from killing him, actually. So uh, now Nimrod, uh, having no place to go, presumably, is uh, staying at his house. And he's so a weird looking dude, and he acknowledges that in the next couple, in the next page, in a couple panels. He hops on a computer, which is equipped with a uh, 80s or uh, early 90s style modem. He's able to get onto the BBSs and hack into mainframes. He admits that the computers are primitive, but he's able to get all the information he needs. The news articles, the history books, nothing matches anything he's familiar with. So he surmises that not only did he travel in time, but he traveled across time, you know, effectively to a different reality. So he's like, well, what do I do next? Uh, my primary mission, Nimrod's primary mission, that is, uh, is to exterminate all mutants. But if this is a different, uh, if the parameters have changed in this timeline, shouldn't the mission change? Uh, I'll have to get some more data, uh, which he immediately gets in the form of a news article where somebody comes on and says, uh, the supervillain juggernaut has been sighted in lower Manhattan. Police SWAT units are on the alert and the Avengers have been notified. Stay tuned for further details. So he just said like, he's going to put this, a pin in the idea of killing all mutants. But as soon as he hear Here's that juggernaut's loose, who's not a mutant. He says, 
all right, I know what I need to do. I'm going to get the juggernaut and then I'm going to kill the X-Men. It sort of makes sense, even in a cheesy sort of way. It's, uh, he, he's, he is jumping to conclusions. I'll give you that. Um, it is totally based on the TV, but maybe that's his new set of parameters is, uh, you know, I'm going to watch the T I'm going to watch the TV. And every time I see a bad person on TV, I'm going to get him. He, he does preface that, that he's going to get the outlaws and he's going to start with the juggernaut and the X-Men who, uh, I guess have been the most recent news articles, uh, or news, news, uh, bits well, they were on the TV as Jamie Rodriguez and his, uh, his friend or brother Louise was just talking about his as you did in your, in your, I have no idea, but you, but your accent was amazing. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so that's it. Uh, that, that is it for X-Men number 193. I think as we've mentioned numerous times, uh, it is definitely a jumping off point for many new stories. Um, Going into this, I don't think there's a whole lot of unresolved stories. I mean, I guess Rachel's kind of unresolved, but are there any other real unresolved storylines? Uh, well, no. I honestly, that you're putting me on the spot. I have no idea. We haven't, Sorry. we haven't recorded in a while. I don't even remember who these X people are. <laughs> I don't even know what an X man is. And, and actually, as I said, for a jumping off point, you could read this issue and almost instantly understand who Rachel is and what her story is without having read her time shift or any of the other stuff that's happened. So maybe, you know, it's been four or five years since uh, Giant Size X-Men number one and, and Chris Claremont's experimenting with this idea of, you know, creating a jumping off point for new readers. And it came in the form of X-Men number 193. It's it's the hundredth issue, so they had to do something, and I guess somebody somewhere decided that they were going to uh, refresh the whole system, and uh, it's good. I liked it. So there you have it. That uh, that was the two hundredth uh, X Men Danger Room Comics Commentary podcast episode, live in video, albeit a little bit blurry video. So maybe for the four hundredth issue, uh, Adam and I will have ten eighty p cameras even though the rest of the world will be on 16K, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, uh, maybe. <laughs> we will always be a step behind when it comes to technology. Uh, and to, to kind of close things out a little bit, just wanted to share one of the voicemails that we received, and, uh, uh, and then we'll just go from there. So here we go. Congratulations on reaching episode 200. It's been wonderful listening to you all 200 episodes with all the fantastic voice acting that you've been doing. Really, you should be getting paid for that. And the commentary and just bringing back the comics that I used to read and love and filling in the gaps of the ones I've never had. So once again, thank you for the 200 episodes, and I look forward to listening to the 200 and the 200 after that, the 200 after that. I mean, they kept making expos. I think he just put us on the hook for 600 more episodes of the X-Men Comics Commentary Podcast. Oh, and Dead Duck 2.0 says, hey, that's me on the voicemail. So it's definitely a he. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Adam, do you have anything that you want to say before we close this thing out? Uh, there will be a podcast. Um, if, you, if you normally get the podcast, uh, it'll probably be edited slightly differently. Um, you don't have to listen to it, or you can. I don't care. Whatever you want to do. Don't For those of you that, that are going to stick around, not stick around because we're going to close this thing down here, but when, when the audio MP3 podcast comes out, there's going to be some Dazzler coverage, which you're not going to want to miss, as well as what else, Adam? You got some some Defenders maybe to talk about? Uh, we got a big issue of New Mutants that I want to talk about, and there a lot of stuff happens in that, um, opening up a, a bunch of new threads as well. So that's that's kind of interesting. So for those of you who think the 200th episode is over, it's over for now, but it's going to continue later on the website. So visit us at www.xmenpodcast.com. Email us at Danger Room uh, at uh, Danger Room. What are we? Danger Room at redcapproductions.com. Call us 501-GET-X-MEN. You can follow us at Danger Room Go on Twitter. We're also at facebook.com forward slash Danger Room Podcast. And uh, I don't know, there's probably some other ways that you can get a hold of us. Go out to iTunes, 
find the podcast, subscribe, leave us a review, leave us some feedback. Uh, we really enjoy that type of thing. Yes. And that... Go, Go ahead. <laughs> it's really hot in here. It is very warm. I got those lights going on. Uh, but until next time, my name is Jeremy. My name's Adam. And this video danger room is closed. <laughs>